you know, obviously we can bury our head in the sand and say, it's never aliens, like yeah. many of my colleagues yes. say. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you, if you never look, you yeah. will never find. If you are not ready to find wonderful things, you will never discover them. And the other thing I would like to say is reality doesn't care whether you ignore it or not. You can ignore reality, but it's still there. Yes. So we can all agree based on Twitter that aliens don't exist, that Oumuamua was a rock. Yeah. We can all agree and you will get a lot of likes, yes. you'll have a big crowd of supporters and everyone be, will be happy and give each other awards and honors and so yes. forth. But Oumuamua might still be <laughs> an alien artifact. Who cares what humans agree on? Yeah, exactly. it, there is a reality out there and we have to be modest enough to recognize that we should make our statements based on evidence. Science is not about ourselves. It's not about glorifying our image. It's not about getting honors, prizes, you know. A lot of the scientific, a lot of the academic activity is geared towards creating your echo chamber where you have students, postdocs repeating your mantras so that your voice is heard loudly so that you can get more honors, prizes, recognition. That's not the purpose of science. The purpose is to figure out what nature is, right? And in the process of doing that, it's a learning experience. Mm -hmm. You make mistakes. You know, Einstein made three mistakes at the end of his career. He argued that in the 1930s, he argued that black holes don't exist, gravitational waves don't exist, and quantum mechanics doesn't have spooky action at a distance. Yes. And all three turned out to be wrong. Okay, so the point is that if you work at the frontier, yes. of, then you make mistakes. It's inevitable because you can't tell what is true or not. And avoiding making mistakes in order to preserve your image makes you extremely boring. Okay, yeah. you will get a prize, but you will be a boring scientist because you will keep repeating things we already know. If you want to make progress, if you want to innovate, you have to take risks and you have to look at the evidence. It's a dialogue with nature. You don't know the, the truth in advance. You let nature tell you, educate you, and then you, you realize that what you thought before is incorrect. And a lot of my colleagues prefer to be in a state where they have a monologue. You know, if you look at these people that work on string theory, yes. uh, they have a monologue. They know what, and in fact, their monologue is centered on anti deceiver space, which we don't live in yeah. now. You know, it's to me, it's just like the Olympics. You know, you, you define 100 meters and you say, whoever runs this 100 meters is the best athlete, the fastest, you know. And uh, it's completely arbitrary. You could have decided it would be 50 meters or 20 meters. Okay. Who cares? You just measure the ability of people this way. So you define anti deceiver space as a space where you do your mathematical gymnastics. Mm -hmm. And then you find who can do it the best and you give jobs based on that. You give prizes based. But... As we said before, you know, nature doesn't care about, you know, the prizes that you give yes. e e to each other. It cares, you know, it has its own reality and yes. we should figure it out. And it's not about us. The scientific activity is about figuring out nature. And sometimes we, we may be wrong. Our image will not be preserved, but it's, that's the fun, you know, I, I, um, kids explore the world mm -hmm. out of curiosity. And I always want to maintain my childhood curiosity. And I don't care about the labels that I have. In fact, ha having tenure is, is exactly the opportunity to behave like a child because yes. you can make mistakes. <laughs> yeah. And I was asked by the Harvard Gazette, you know, the, the, new, the yeah. Pravda of Harvard, <laughs> uh, what, what is yeah. the one thing that you would like to change about the world? Yes. And I said, I would like my colleagues to behave more like kids. Yeah. That's the one thing I would like them to do because something bad happens to these kids when they become tenured professors. Yeah. They start to worry about their ego yeah. and about themselves more than about the purpose of science, which is you know, curiosity-driven, figuring out from evidence. Evidence is the key. So when an object shows anomalies like umuamua, what's the problem discussing, you know, whether it's artificial or not? You know, so there was, I should tell you, there was a mainstream paper in Nature yes. published saying it must be natural. That's it. It's unusual, but it must be natural, period. And then at the same time, 
uh, the, those main, some other mainstream uh, scientists tried to explain the properties. Yes. And they came up with interpretations like it's a dust bunny, you know, the kind that you find in a household, a collection mm -hmm. of dust particles mm -hmm. pushed by sunlight, something we have never seen before. Or it's a hydrogen iceberg. It actually evaporates like a but comet, but hydrogen is transparent. You don't see it. And that's why we don't see the cometary tail. Right. Again, we have never seen something like that. In both cases, the objects would not survive the, the long journey. Yes. We, we discussed it in a paper that I wrote afterwards. But my point is, those that tried to explain the unusual properties went into great length at discussing things that we have never seen before, okay? Mm -hmm. So even when you think about a natural origin, you have to come up with scenarios that of things that were never seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, they look less plausible to me personally. But my point is, if we discuss things that were never seen before, right? Why not discuss, why not contemplate an artificial origin? What's the problem? Why do people have this pushback uh, you know, I worked on, on dark matter and um, we don't know what most of the matter in the universe is. Yeah. It's called dark matter. It's just an acronym because we have no clue. We simply don't know. So it could be all kinds of particles. And over the years, people suggested weakly interacting massive particles, axions, all kinds of particles. And experiments were made. They cost hundreds of millions of dollars. They put upper limits constraints that ruled out many of the possibilities that were proposed as natural initially. Yes. The mainstream community regarded it as a mainstream activity to search the nature of the dark matter. And they, nobody complained that it's speculative to consider weakly interacting massive particles. Now, I ask you, why is it speculative to consider extraterrestrial technologies? We have a proof that it exists here on Earth. Yes, We also know that the conditions of, of, of Earth are reproduced in billions of systems throughout the Milky Way galaxy. So what's more conservative than to say, if you arrange for similar conditions, you get the same outcome. How can you imagine this to be speculative? It's not speculative at all. Yeah. And nevertheless, it's regarded the periphery. And at the same time, you have physicists, theoretical physicists, working on extra dimensions, supersymmetry, uh, super string theory, yes. the multiverse, maybe we live in a simulation. Yes. All of these ideas that have no grounding in reality, some of which sound to me like, you know, just like what someone would say. Uh, Science if, fiction, basically. Because you have no way to test it, uh, you know, through experiments. And experiments really are key. It's not just a nuance. You say, okay, forget about experiments. As some philosophers try to say, you know, if there is a consensus, what's the problem? The point is, it's key, then that's what Galileo found. Yes. It's key to have feedback from reality. Yes. You know, you can think that you have a billion dollar or that you are more rich than, you know, uh, Elon Musk. That's fine. You can feel very happy about it. You can talk about it with your friends and all of you will be happy and think about what you can do with the money. Then you go to an ATM machine and you make an experiment. You yes. check how much money you have in, in, in your checking account. And if it turns out that, you know, you, you don't have much, you can't, you can't materialize your dreams. Okay, yes. so you realize you have a reality check. Yes. And my point is, without experiments giving you a reality check, without the ATM machine showing you whether your ideas are bankrupt or not, without putting skin in the game, and by skin in the game, I mean, don't just talk about theoretical ideas, make them testable. If you don't make them testable, they're worthless. They're just like theology that is not testable. By the way, theology has some tests. Let me give you <laughs> That's th interesting. three examples. Yes. Um, it turns out that my book already inspired a PhD student at Harvard in the English department uh -huh. to pursue a PhD in that direction. And uh, she invited me to the PhD exam a couple of months ago. And in the exam, one of the examiners, a professor, asked her, do you know why Giordano Bruno was burnt at the stake? And she said, no, I think it's because he was an obnoxious guy and uh, irritated a lot of people, yes. which is true. But the professor said, no, it's because Giordano Bruno said that other stars are just like the sun and they could have a planet like the earth around them 
that could host life. Oh, And that was offensive to the church. Why was it offensive? Because there is the possibility that this life sinned, okay? And if that life sinned on planets around other stars, it should have been saved by Christ. And then you need multiple copies of Christ. And that's unacceptable. How can you have duplicates of Christ? Right. And so they burned the guy. So it was about, that's, okay, I'm just like loading this all in because that's kind of brilliant. So he, he was actually already, into, it's not just about the stars, it's anticipating that there could be other life forms. Yeah. Like why, if this star, if there's other stars, why would it be special? Why would our star yeah. be special? He was and making then, the right arguments. And, and he would just follow that all along to say like, there should be other Earth, Earth-like places, there should be other life, life. forms. And, and then, then that there was needs offensive. to be copies of Christ. <laughs> yeah, so that was uh, offensive. So I said, yeah. I said to that, um, <laughs> I said to that professor, I said, great, you know, I, I wanted to introduce some scientific tone to the discussion. Yes. And I said, this is great because now you basically laid the foundation for an experimental test of this theology. Yeah. What is the test? We now know that other stars are like the sun. And we know they have planets like the Earth around them. So suppose we find life there and we figure out that they sinned. Then we ask them, did you witness Christ? Mm -hmm. And if they say no, it means that this, this theology is ruled out. So there is an experimental test. So this is experimental test number one. Another experimental test, you know, uh, <laughs> in the Bible, you know, in the Old Testament, Abraham, uh, was uh, heard the voice, the voice of God, to sacrifice his son, mm -hmm. right? Only son. And uh, that's what the story says. Now, suppose Abraham, my name, by the way, had uh, <laughs> a voice memo up on his cell phone. Yes. He could have pressed this up and recorded the voice of God. Yeah. And that would have been experimental evidence that God exists, mm -hmm. right? Fortunately, he didn't. But It's an experimental test, mm -hmm. right? There is a third example I should tell, and that is Elie Wiesel attributed this story to Martin Buber, but it's not clear whether it's true or not. At any event, the story goes that Martin Buber, you know, he was a philosopher and he said, you know, the Christians argue that Jesus, you know, the, the Messiah arrived already and will come back again in the future. The Jews argue the Messiah never came and will arrive in the future. So he said, why argue? Both sides agree that the Messiah will arrive in the future. <laughs> When the Messiah arrives, we can ask whether he or she <laughs> came before, you yeah. know, like visited us <laughs> and then figure it out. And yeah. one side, so again, experimental test of a theology. Yes. So even theology, if it puts a skin in the game, you know, if it makes a prediction, mm -hmm. could be tested, right? Uh, so why can't string theories test themselves? Or why can't, you know, even cosmic inflation, that's another model that, uh, you know, one of the inventors from MIT, mm -hmm. Alan Guth, argues that it's not falsifiable. Mm -hmm. uh, I arg My point is, a theory that cannot be falsified is not helpful, because it means that you can't make progress. You cannot improve your understanding of nature. The only way for us to learn about nature is by making hypotheses that are testable, doing the experiments and learning whether we are correct or not. So be, and coupled that with a, a curiosity and open-mindedness that allows us to explore all kinds of possible hypotheses, but always the pursuit of those, the, the, the scientific rigor around those hypotheses is ultimately get evidence. Knowledge is of, of, of what nature is, should be a dialogue with nature yes, a rather dialogue. than a monologue. Monologue, beautifully put.